Well, let's get into our text of the day and our topic. We are going to study, on, in some fashion, the entire book of Esther. Now, if you've not read it before, it's 10 chapters. We're not going to read all 10 chapters. We're doing more of an overview of the book of Esther, looking at the partic- in particular at the relationship between Esther and Mordecai, which, I'll expo- well, which will be explained uh, shortly as part of our series, Men and Women in Christ, A Divine Harmony. And although it's men and women in Christ, and this is Old Testament, nonetheless, it points forward to what God intends once we have Christ for that to be the way it transforms our relationships as men and women, not only married couples, but men and women in general, because Esther and Mordecai were not married, as we uh, will see. And so we're looking at the book of Esther today, not to examine all of what is in it, because there is an amazing amount of wonderful lessons and, and inspiration in it. But what we're doing today is we're looking at it through the particular lens we are taking to these texts at the moment, exploring men and women's relationships and hopefully getting a picture as to what God intends. Now, since many of us won't know this book very well, and that's understandable, rather than me try and explain it, what we're going to do is something a bit different, which is watch uh, one of the Bible Project videos. If you're familiar with them, they do summaries of books, and this is their summary of the book of Esther. It's about nine minutes long, but I think you'll find it sufficiently entertaining and interesting to hold your attention. While we're playing and watching this video, I'd like to ask you to do something, which is to ask yourself just a question. Let's go back. One, when you're watching this video about what the Book of Esther is about, ask yourself this question. What does the relationship between Esther and Mordecai, the two main characters, teach us about men and women working together for God? using our gifts for God. What, is, what do we pick up from that? And hopefully that will, will help us. So let's play this video and see what we learn. The book of Esther, it's one of the more exciting and curious books in the Bible. The story is set over 100 years after the Babylonian exile of the Israelites from their land. And while some Jews did return to Jerusalem, remember Ezra and Nehemiah, many did not. And so the book of Esther is about a Jewish community living in Susa, the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire. The main characters in this story are two Jews, Mordecai and then his niece Esther. And then there's the king of Persia, who's something of a drunken pushover in this story. And then there's the Persian official Haman, the cunning villain. Now this is a curious book in the Bible, mainly for the fact that God is never even mentioned, not once. Which might strike you as kind of odd. I mean, isn't the Bible about God? But this is a brilliant technique by the author, who's anonymous, by the way. It's an invitation to read this story looking for God's activity, and there are signs of it everywhere. The story is full of very odd, quote, coincidences and ironic reversals, and it all forces you to see God's purpose at work, but behind the scenes. Let's just dive into the story. The book opens with the king of Persia throwing two elaborate banquet feasts that last a total of 187 days. And it's all for the grandiose purpose of displaying his greatness and splendor. On the last day of the banquet feast, he's really drunk, and he demands that his wife, Queen Vashti, appear at the party to show off her beauty. She refuses, and so in a drunken rage, the king deposes Vashti and makes the silly decree that all Persian men should now be the masters of their own homes. Then he holds a beauty pageant because he wants to find a new queen. This is like a really bad soap opera. But it's right here that we're introduced to Esther and Mordecai. Esther hides her Jewish identity and enters the beauty pageant and wins. And the king is so obsessed with Esther that he elevates her to become the new queen of Persia. Now after this, and even more serendipitous, is the fact that Mordecai just happens to overhear two royal guards plotting to murder the king. And so he informs Esther, who in turn informs the king, and Mordecai gets credit for saving the king's life. Now, right here from the beginning, God's not mentioned anywhere, but this all seems providentially ordered. What is it that God's up to? You have to keep reading. We're next introduced to Haman, who's not actually a Persian. He's called an Agagite. He's a descendant of the ancient Canaanites. Remember for Samuel chapter 15. The king elevates Haman to the highest position in the kingdom, and he demands that everybody kneel before Haman. Well, when Mordecai sees Haman, he refuses to kneel, which of course fills Haman with rage. And when he finds out that Mordecai's Jewish, Haman successfully persuades the king to enact this crazy decree to destroy all of the Jewish people. 
And to decide the date of the Jews' annihilation, Haman rolls the dice. A die is called pur in Hebrew. Tuck that away for later. Eleven months later, on the 13th of Adar, all the Jews will die. Haman and the king then have a drinking banquet to celebrate their really horrible decision. So the focus now turns to Mordecai and Esther, who are the only hope for the Jewish people. They make a plan that Esther is going to reveal her Jewish identity to the king and ask him to reverse the decree. But approaching the king without a royal request is, according to Persian law, an act worthy of death. So in a key statement, Mordecai, he's confident that even if Esther remains silent, that deliverance for the Jews will arrive from another place. And then Mordecai wonders aloud. He says, who knows? Maybe you've become queen for this very moment. Esther responds with bravery, and she purposes to go to the king with her amazing words, if I perish, I perish. Now, in what unfolds, we watch the ironic reversal of all of Haman's evil plans. So Esther hosts the king and Haman at a first banquet, and she says that she wants to make a special request of both of them at an exclusive banquet the following day. So Haman leaves the banquet totally drunk, and he sees Mordecai in the street. He fumes with anger, and he orders that a tall stake be built so that Mordecai can be impaled upon it in the morning. It seems like things can't get any worse for the Jews and for Mordecai, but All of a sudden, the story pivots. It just so happens that night, the king, he can't sleep. And he has the royal chronicles read to him for good bedtime reading. And he just happens to hear about how Mordecai had saved the king's life. He had totally forgotten. So in the morning, Haman enters to request Mordecai's execution. And the king in that moment orders Haman to honor Mordecai publicly for saving his life. So now Haman has to lead Mordecai around the city on a royal horse, telling everyone to praise him. Now this moment in the story, it's a pivot for the whole book. It begins Haman's down fall and Mordecai's rise to power. Watch how this works. The day after is Esther's second banquet. So the king and Haman arrive and Esther informs the king that first of all she's Jewish and second that Haman has enacted a decree to murder her and to murder Mordecai who saved his life and to murder all of the Jews. Now the king's had a lot to drink so when he hears this news he goes into yet one more drunken rage and he orders that Haman be impaled on the very stake he made for Mordecai. It's ironic and a grisly way for Haman to go. Haman's execution, however, doesn't solve the problem of the decree to kill all of the Jews. So the focus now turns to Esther and Mordecai as they make a plan to reverse the decree. They discover that the king can't revoke a decree that he's already made. So instead, the king commissions Mordecai to issue a counter-decree. On the appointed day that all of the Jews were supposed to be killed, the 13th of Adar, now the Jews are ordered to defend themselves and to destroy any who plotted to kill them. Then Mordecai, Esther, and Jews everywhere hold banquets and feasts to celebrate this new decree, and Mordecai is elevated to a seat beside the king. Eventually, the decreed day comes, and the Jews triumph over their enemies. First, they destroy Haman's family, and then any other Persian officials who had joined in Haman's plot. And then on a second day, they get permission to destroy any who plotted against them throughout the entire kingdom. This results in joy and celebration as the Jews are rescued from annihilation. The story then tells about how Esther and Mordecai establish by decree this annual two-day feast of Purim to commemorate their deliverance from destruction. And the name of the feast comes from Haman's dice. Remember, pur im. The book concludes with a short epilogue as Mordecai is elevated to second in command in the kingdom, and we are told now of his royal greatness and splendor as the Jews thrive in exile. Now, step back. Notice how this whole story has been designed. The story was full of moments of ironic reversal, but we can now see the whole story is structured as an ironic reversal, right down to the details. So the king's splendor and feasts and decrees are mirrored by Mordecai's splendor and feasts and decrees at the end. Esther and Mordecai, they first saved the king, but now in the end, they save all of the Jews. Then you have Haman's elevation and edicts and banquet that gets reversed by Mordecai's elevation and edict and banquet. And then at the center, you have Esther and Mordecai's planning scenes, and then Esther's two banquets that act as a frame around the greatest moment of reversal in the whole story, Haman's humiliation and Mordecai's exaltation. Beautiful. Another fascinating feature of this book is the moral ambiguity of the characters. There's a lot of drinking and anger and sex and murder, of which Mordecai and Esther are a part, not to mention their violation of many commands in the Torah, like marrying Gentiles or eating impure foods. And so the story is not putting Mordecai and Esther forward as moral example as if it endorses all of their behavior. But they are put forward as models of trust and hope when things get really bad. 
And so the book of Esther comes back to that question with which we begin, why God is not mentioned. The message of this book seems to be that when God seems absent, when his people are in exile, when they're unfaithful to the Torah, does this mean that God is done with Israel? Has God abandoned his promises? And the book of Esther says no. It invites us to see that God can and does work in the real mess and moral ambiguity of human history. And he uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people to accomplish his purposes. And so the book of Esther asks us to be willing to trust God's providence even when we can't see it working. And to hope that no matter how bad things get, God is committed to redeeming his world. And that's what the book of Esther is all about. So uh, that gives us the overview of what's actually happening, and now we've got that bigger picture. Preferably, we can dig into some aspects of that that are relevant for what we are looking at ourselves uh, at this point in time. And so let me ask you, who do Esther and Mordecai remind you of? Who do they remind you of when you think about uh, other characters in Scripture? Who might they remind you of? Priscilla and Aquila. Okay. New Testament, yeah. Anybody else? Think about what they were accomplishing, what God called them to do at that time. Rebecca and Jacob? Yeah, okay, Rebecca and Jacob. I was thinking about last week. Deborah and Barak. In a sense, I mean, God raised up a savior for his people. And a woman was pivotal, pivotal, pivotal to that, just like Deborah. You could look at them like that, or perhaps you might think of uh, Joseph being in a foreign land and being used by God to preserve God's people, or Moses for that matter. There are quite a few parallels with Moses and the Exodus in the story, if you want to dig into that a bit more uh, later. So what do we learn about Esther's relationship with Mordecai? Let's think about Esther. There's an early uh, photograph. Where is she? Yes, there she is. Right, nice photograph. Um, uh, what do we learn about Esther's relationship with Mordecai? So let me point a few things out. No, actually, let me ask you, have you seen anything so far? What do you think about her relationship with Mordecai? She is his cousin, right, raised by Mordecai as an adoptive parent, effectively, because her parents died when she was young. So what do we know about the, what we've seen in the story? What does that tell us about the kind of relationship they had? What did you notice? Pretty good relationship. Affection. Affection, did you say? Yeah, yeah. Loving relationship. He was a bit like a mentor to her. That's right, Simon. Good communication, good communication between the two of them. Yeah, they were well informed, kept in good touch. Yeah. Bemi? They were kind of real with each other at various moments. Yeah, Stefan, you... trust. trust, okay. Trust, I think, is a big thing in the story, isn't it? Anything else? Let me give you three quick things. Um, firstly, what we see about her with Mordecai is that she was obedient to him. In chapter 2, verse 10, she didn't reveal her nationality, her family background. Why? Because Mordecai forbade her to do that. So she's obedient. And later on in chapter 2, Esther kept her secret, secret her family background and nationality as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. So that's interesting. She is obedient to him. So there's a, some kind of respect, trust, and authority thing going on to some degree there, right? That's one thing. The second thing I see in their relationship is that she is concerned for him. Somebody said loving. Uh, when Esther's eunuchs and fat female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. This is when he goes out weeping because the Jews have been, are going to be killed. He's found out about it. She sent clothes for him to put on because he was wearing sackcloth. She's like, oh, we can't be having that. That's my, that's my cousin. That's my adoptive parent. We can't have him going around in sackcloth. She gets organizes for some clothes, presumably from the king's wardrobe in some sense, to be sent out to him to put on instead of his sackcloth. Uh, he wouldn't accept them. But nonetheless, she organizes that. I think it's a lovely, concerned, kind of loving thing to do. She's also protective of him. She figures out for Mordecai to be saved. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, 
who is he? This is the, the, the section where uh, uh, Esther's hosting this banquet for Mordecai, not for Mordecai, for Haman and for the king. And uh, she's going to expose Haman as the bad guy. And she's got the king in the place where he's ready. And Haman's right there. And the king sa- uh, she tells him, someone's going to kill all my people. And the king says, who is it? And she says, the ma- uh, says this man, the, an adversary and an enemy, this vile Haman. She exposes him, which saves herself, but also uh, uh, Mordecai and all the people. There's a protective side to what she's doing here. And... She's generous towards him. This is the end of the story, or not quite the very end, but near the end of the story when things are resolved. And it says the same day, King Xerxes gave Esther, Queen Esther, the estate of Haman. This is after Haman has been gruesomely impaled on that stake. Uh, he was the enemy of the Jews. Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So circumstances have changed. The secret is now out. The king took off his signet ring, very significant which he'd reclaimed from Haman, because Haman used to have that because he was the second in command. And he gave it to Mordecai. And then look what, I love this last little phrase. And Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. The king does some things, but then Esther has some power. She has some influence and she uses it to bless Mordecai. She could have kept that for herself, that estate, or she could have given it to anybody. But she generously gives it to, in fact, she's got it really, but she gives him, the uh, oversight. He appointed him over that estate. It's interesting what we can see in a short book about the relationship. So we see that she's obedient to him, concerned for him, protective of him, and generous to him. Now let's have a look at what we learn about Mordecai's relationship with Esther. What do we see in, uh, in this book? So rather similarly, we see that he is concerned for her. When she goes into the harem, It says that every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. You can just imagine him pacing up and down, pacing up and down, pacing up and down. It's like when you have somebody you love deeply in a hospital or something, and you're not sure how it's going to turn out. And you'll often be walking up and down the the hospital corridors, waiting for the next bit of news about your parent or your child or your spouse. And you can't sit still. You're just so concerned. And he's, he's there, close to her, as close as he can get, because he can't get into the harem, but he's not going to be allowed to do that. But he's getting as close as he can, walking up and down, presumably asking people who pass by, how is Esther? Is she okay? Does she, have any, does she have everything she needs? Is she all right? Asking how she was and what was happening. Give me the latest. And that's, that's his devotion to her. He's concerned for her. Another thing we learn about Mordecai's relationship with Esther is he challenges her. This is an interesting dynamic. So the plot against the Jews is being enacted. And Mordecai goes to speak to Esther. And he says to her, don't think because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. You're not, you're not immune. You may be in the palace, but you won't escape. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Many commentators see that as saying God will intervene in a different way. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Isn't that a famous phrase, right? For such a time as this. And because Mordecai has already told her you need to act, and she's terrified. She's like, I can't do that. I'm going to die. If I go into the king's presence, I'll die. And he's like, well, you can choose when to die. You can die when you go into the king's presence, or you can die later when they kill all the Jews. But, mm, you know, you have an opportunity to stop all of this. He challenges her. And that, that is a sign of trust in a way, isn't it? I mean, he's certainly desperate, but he trusts that she can do something Wonderful, magnificent, epoch-making, history-making that would change the destiny of the, of the whole nation, of the race. He trusts her. He believes in her. And thereby, or therefore, he challenges her, challenges her to accept responsibility. People with a good relationship are able to challenge each other, to bring the best out of each other, to help each other to be more for God than they would be otherwise. A third thing we see, interesting, I think, is that he is obedient 
to her. Earlier we saw that she was obedient to him, but now she sends this reply to Mordecai, go and gather all the Jews who are in Susa, that's the city, fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast with you, uh, as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. I bolded that word there. She, he carried out her instructions, not desire, wish, request. Isn't that interesting? So in one, uh, in one context, she's obedient to him. In another context, he's obedient to her. So, okay, if you need three days, take three days. If you need to fast, fast. Yes, I will fast with you. Yes, I will get all the Jews in the land, and who knows how many, but certainly tens of thousands and quite possibly hundreds of thousands, I'll get them to fast as well. He carries out her instructions. And thirdly, fourthly, sorry, fourthly, he cooperates with her. They work together. They have a working relationship that actually works. Uh, chapter 9, towards the end of the book, after most things are resolved, uh, Queen Esther, along with Mordecai, they wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter concerning Purim. So what happens is this throwing of the dice called Pur um, it, it got turned into the Jewish festival of Purim, uh, which is based on the same word, which celebrates what God did there in rescuing God's people. And the, the first letter uh, decree that made by the king was the Jews have to be all killed. It can't, uh, can't uh, cancel that decree against, against the law of the land. And so he puts out a second decree to say, okay, we, all these people that might attack the Jews, the Jews have the right to defend themselves. They can fight back. And it's, it's so like, I don't know, it's a fair fight now. They can fight back, and they do. And according to history, uh, it's thought that tens of thousands of uh, people on, um, on the attacker's side died. Um, so that's the second letter. So it's Mordecai and Esther are writing that. They send the letters to all the Jews in 127 provinces, words of goodwill and assurance, establishing the days of Purim at their designated times. Mordecai the Jew, Queen Esther had decreed, they established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fasting and lamentation. So that's the ongoing festival. And then again, Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim. And it was written down in the records. They worked together, but that little last phrase I find interesting is Esther's decree. Uh, a woman in that context, in that culture, very unusual to see this. So they worked together, and it appears that Mordecai is not threatened by Esther's power, by her authority. They're able to work together in a healthy way. So what do we learn about men and women working together? What do we think God might be showing us from this story about the way that he's planned for men and women to work together? Let me make a few suggestions. Firstly, each person has a part to play. Esther's part is different to Mordecai's, but both play their part. It reminds me of Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, where it says, speaking the truth in love, we, congregationally, will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, from him the whole body, he's talking about congregation here, joined, held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Each part. He's not talking about men doing the work or women doing the work. He's talking about congregationally. Each part does his work. That's what we see with Mordecai and Esther. Similarly to 1 Corinthians 12, that whole chapter, about how we need the different parts in the body to be working well together to bless the whole. God has put these parts together in the body uh, some parts have greater honor, some have less, but there should be no division. The parts have equal concern for each other. And in, in respect of all people, but they're talking about men and women here, there should be equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If the men are suffering, the women suffer with them. If the women are suffering, the men suffer with them. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So we work together, each person playing their part so that the congregation as a whole is benefited. And something else I think we see in this passage, which is rather interesting to me anyway, is that they accept each other's 
accept their vulnerability in, with the other person. So on some levels, Esther is vulnerable regarding Mordecai and also the other way around. And it reminds me of this New Testament instruction, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Esther has to submit to Mordecai's leadership in some ways. And Mordecai has to submit to Esther's leadership in some ways. And that makes you vulnerable. Submitting to anybody makes you vulnerable. Submitting to the authorities makes you vulnerable. Uh, there are instructions in Scripture, which we're not going to deal with today, but we will be dealing with in our teaching classes, about the passages that talk about wives submitting to husbands. What does that mean in the context? I'm not going to deal with it right here. But we've also got the command for slaves to submit to masters. We've got the command for uh, members of churches to submit to elders. We've got the command for members of churches to submit to leaders. We've got the command uh, for Christians to submit to authorities. And we've also got the command in Scripture for all Christians to submit to God. There's a lot of submission, actually, in the Bible in different contexts, meaning slightly different things in different contexts. And one of the things we're trying to figure out, not today, but as we go forward, is it, what does it mean to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ? And what is the relevance regarding particularly men and women? That's, we're getting into that as we go along. But my point today is, any kind of submission makes us vulnerable. And that vulnerability depends a lot then on how we handle it, it depends on our trust in God and the trust we've built in our relationships. Asking people to submit to God when we don't know God well enough to trust him isn't going to work very well. But asking us in congregationally to submit to one another doesn't work very well unless we love each other and trust one another. And asking men and women to submit in whatever may, way that means it, me, it means to submit is going to be very difficult if we don't have relationships of trust. And that may be the key where we begin as we then get into what it means to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There does seem to me with Esther and Mordecai a mutual uh, interdependence. They needed each other. Israel, the Jews, needed Esther. They needed Mordecai. Both do their part. So, to summarize, what do we learn about their work together? I'd say these five things at least. I tried to organize them into an acronym that would spell something, but I failed. So if anybody can do that for me, uh, feel free. Uh, but they both brought their gifts into the situation, their circumstances, their opportunities. They had different opportunities. Mordecai was connected to the royal court. Uh, some people think that he was maybe head of their sort of secret service, which is why he overheard those guards plotting to assassinate the king. He might have been involved with that kind of thing. Who knows for sure? But they had different gifts. They brought them to the table. They had different opportunities. They brought those to the table. Um, and they took responsibility for doing what they could. So they shared. They both used their gifts. They both took the opportunities God gave them. They were both necessary for God's plan. If one of them had done what they were meant to do and the other one didn't, it wouldn't have worked out. They were both necessary for fulfilling God's will for their lives and the blessings that came to others through them. They needed each other. They both had influence. In the story, neither Esther nor Mordecai, in my reading of it, neither of them is dominant. They have different roles, but they're both equally significant. They both exert influence. They both have influence over one another, which is rather interesting. And finally, I've put the word authority there because, in a sense, I think, as we've seen, there are times when Esther commands Mordecai and there are times when Mordecai commands Esther. There's some mutual commanding going on here, depending on the circumstances. And what might that tell us about how we work together as men and women? So, to wrap up, what do we learn about God in this story that strangely doesn't mention God? Maybe we learn that God rewards faith. And that faith primarily is expressed through sacrificial love and courage. Which brings us to Jesus, doesn't it? How did Jesus live? He lived a life of, well, faithful obedience to the Father. And that faithful obedience was expressed in his sacrificial love and his courage. His love for us that gave him the courage to go to the cross. Esther demonstrated great faith. She depended on God, even though God isn't mentioned. Why else would you fast for three days and nights? 
She depended on God, not on her beauty. She didn't go into the king and flirt with him and try and use her intelligence, her charm, her wit, or her beauty to win him over. She declared a fast and then just said, right, I'm going in to see the king. As uh, John Altberg put it, Esther asked Mordecai to gather all of God's people in Susa for three days of fasting and prayer. She refuses to try to achieve this mission based on her beauty, her cleverness, her influence, though they are great. Jesus had so many gifts, didn't he? Couldn't have he had done it a different way? He was so intelligent, so wise, so knowledgeable, so powerful. Did he have to go to the cross? He went to the cross because the Father said, this is the way. He trusted the Father. And this is a really helpful model for you and I as we face the challenges of our lives, is to trust God, not taking things into our own hands. Before we take the bread and wine, we're going to read this scripture and just think about it for a moment. Titus chapter 3. Just think about this as we come to taking bread and wine. At one time, we too were foolish. You don't have to say amen, but <laughs> disobedient, deceived, and slayed by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated, hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through, through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. The bread and the wine remind us of the quality of Jesus' trust of God his Father, and they remind us of the value of trusting God ourselves. Because the cross isn't the end. The cross leads to the empty tomb. And that's the symbol and reality of hope that means that we have hope in this life. We have hope now and forevermore. We have what we need. And God may guide us, and he will guide us into what he wants us to be as people, as a congregation, as men and women. I trust that. I believe that. Let's pray together before we take bread and wine. And Atkinson will come up and pray for us.